I'm glad to be with you all. Um, we've been continuing in this line. I'm not sure this is coming through all right, but um, Abraham's background and God's calling. And I really appreciate just the tie-in to this verse here. We're going to hear a little bit about the first mention of a priest in the Bible. It's not where we thought it was going to be. It's right here in the middle of this story about Abram. But as we listen to this story, we want to remember that this is not a story about someone just historically that we can't identify with or relate to. But we're going to see that this story that we're going to hear today in Genesis 13 and 14 connects very much to someone who can understand us, someone who's been in the same situation as us, and someone who's been brought through that situation. So let's jump into a little bit of the background. We're on a topic today of fighting for the brother by the interceding Christ. There's some words in there we're going to unpack, so don't worry, we'll get into the story. And we're just going to walk through four points today. The first one is about Abram and his brother, actually his nephew, his father's, um, sorry, his brother's son named Lot. You may have heard about Lot. You may know this little short verse in the Old Test, uh, short verse in the New Testament. Remember Lot's wife. That will be a later story. But to, today we're going to hear a little bit about Lot um, in the early part of his journey. And maybe I'll, I'll jump through this. So just a little background. And for those of you who were here last week, you heard about this, that there was this striving between Lot's herdsmen and Abram's herdsmen. Remember, Abram's traveling along. He's got his nephew with him. They're both just kind of men developing in their livelihood. And now the cattle are running into problems because they want to eat the same grass. So Abram says, OK, I think we might need to find a way to resolve this. And so they look at the land, and Lot chooses, as we can see here in Genesis 13, land that's the, off the entire plain of the east of the Jordan. I'll show you a map in just a second. But the crucial thing is here, they separated themselves. That's a little warning to us, right? As believers, we want to be careful when we separate ourselves. We don't want to separate ourselves from those who are leading us in the Lord. Right? So this is a consideration here. This was maybe Lot's first little failure, that he agreed to separate himself from those who had brought him on. And not just that, you can see how far the separation went. He ended up dwelling in the cities of the plain. He moved his tent as far as Sodom. And we just know the biblical and even the historical connotation of Sodom even carries to today in God's eyes, this was a very wicked place. And the people there were living in, in wickedness and sin. And so I'm just going to take a second because I'm a, I'm a map lover here. We're about to tell a story here. And you can see this little green area. There's Sodom right there. Over here is the Jordan River. Right there is the Dead Sea. And the next set of verses we're about to pop into are in Genesis um, 14 at the beginning, and you don't actually have them, so I'm just going to read them to you while, you while you look at this map. And it says, In the days of Amraphel the king of Shinar, Arioch the king of Eleazar, we're looking over here, Kader Laomer the king of Elam, and Tidal the king of Goim, these kings made war. Any of you all like to hear war stories, war movies, maybe? There was a generation that just used to love to watch war movies. Now, not so much, right? But this is one of the stories in the Bible where we're hearing about an international affair, an international conflict, and it's recorded in the divine record for a reason. And the war is against Bera, the king of Sodom, Bersha, the king of Gomorrah, Shinab, the king of Adma. Shemeber, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor. So these little five cities. And as the verses go on in Genesis 14, what we find out is that these kingdoms over here were collecting protection tithes from the kingdoms of, over here in the plain. And so they were protecting from these armies and attacks from different regions. And every year they had to pay a tribute. If you paid your tribute, you got protected. Well, 12 years went on. And something happened in the situation here 
where these said, we're not going to pay the tithe anymore. And so the 13th year, no money came. The 14th year, Kader Laomer, the king of Elam, led these four kingdoms and their armies. And they came down, and there's a little progression there to basically say, payday, right? Pay your taxes. Come. And the four armies came down. And you'd expect five armies against four. Let's do the math. Who's going to win? Right? We'd expect, according to our concept, the five armies guarding their own territory would win. But according to this story, and we'll see, this is actually arranged by God, the four armies triumphed. And not just triumphed, it's almost ridiculous. The kings of Sodom and kings of Gomorrah, they got stuck in a tar pit. Like this is their backyard. They're supposed to be defending this, and they got stuck. So it's just kind of like improbable that the four are defeating the five. But look at that. This still isn't a story about a military conflict. Which one of these cities has something important to God in it? Remember Sodom, that wicked, sinful place where Lot, a chosen one who had followed Abram, had separated himself to? So in this battle where the four came down, they took the possessions of Sodom, including Lot, and they began to bring them back up on their journey back up. And now here's where we're going to jump into some verses. If you flip over to the back, you're going to see Genesis 14, 14 to 17a. And let's have all the brothers read 14 for us. And when Abram heard that his brother had been taken captive, he led out his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and pursued as far as Dan. And the sisters, 15, fighted his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and struck them and pursued them to Hobah, which is north of Damascus. The brothers, 16. And he brought back all the possessions and also brought back Lot, his brother, and his possessions, as well as the women and the people, and 17 sisters. And after his return from the slaughter of Kedar Laomer and the kings who were with him. So let's pause right here. We've already established this army of four is coming down. They've got the possessions of Sodom. They actually went down even further to some of those cities. And now they're going back up, and the report comes back to Abram. Now, Abram could have had a response that said, Lot, why would we even get to this spot? But now that you separated, you kind of deserve it, right? You separated from me, and you didn't just separate. You went way over here to this wicked place. Like, like that could just have been Abram's response. And we can ask ourselves this, because I'm going to personalize this a little bit. Right? We may be in a situation where we have a little bit of a disagreement with someone who's our brother or someone who's our sister. And then they go and separate themselves, and then something happens to them. Maybe there's a little bit in us that says, serves them right. right? That's where that expression comes from. Right? Serves, they got what, what's coming to them. I'll raise my hand. I've, I've thought that before. Right? They didn't agree with me, so they did that. Well, they got what's coming to them. That could have been Abram's response. And sometimes that is our response. And that's why we sang that song about the high priest, right? Because we have that weakness. But look at his response. When he heard this news, he mustered 318 servants, these ones who had been trained. And right away, he went to pursue. Because his thought was, I need to fight for Lot. It's not OK that Lot was in that situation. And even worse, now that he's captured, it's not OK. And so basically, he's coming around from this side. He intercepts the army of four who has Lot. And he slaughters them. And as if it's not. Again, that's a, that's a very strong word. That means to wipe out completely, right? To, to, to leave n no, um, to take no quarter, no, no survivors. You're just 
slaughter these kings. But, and I was just reading this, it wasn't even all of Abram. As if Abram was doing something kind of bold and maybe not so wise with 318 going against an army of four that had just defeated an army of five. You kind of step back and say, is that a wise thing to do? We realize there was something motivating him that when he heard the news of Lot's capture, right away he said, I need to go get him. And again, we want to just kind of consider this motivation. Where did that motivation come from? Because as he went, he didn't just go with 318. He divided his forces. So it's half of 318, right? Maybe 100, what is that, 159, somewhere in there, if it was an even split. So with that number, he went, gained the victory, and brought back his brother. And so that's a little bit of the historical kind of picture there. And some of these, um, I, I, again, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for another, uh, another day. But as he's returning now, coming out to meet him is this incredible little passage. And it talks about this character. And I'm just going to name him for us, Melchizedek. And he shows up here, and let's read this verse all together on Genesis 14, 18. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was priest of God the Most High. And I'll keep reading. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God the Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God the Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of all. So this little story, in the midst of Lot being recaptured, sorry, Lot being captured and repossessed by Abram, brought back, there's this little interlude, and along comes this king, Melchizedek, and it talks later about him. We don't even know his genealogy. We don't know who his parents were. We don't even know how he got to be king. Some of these other kings, we know a little bit of their progression. He just shows up. And he's not just the, a king. We find out his title means he's the king of righteousness, Melchizedek. And not just that title, but it also says he's the king of Salem. And if you've heard the word Jerusalem, that place, it's the city of peace. Here comes a, a king who's not slaughtering, right? Abram did the slaughtering. He's coming as a king of peace. And as a king of peace, he's coming with a particular service to Abram. And that service is to feed him. It's to feed him bread and wine. And so I just want you to recognize this is the first time in the Bible that a priestly service is mentioned. Right? We'll hear about priests in Exodus. We'll hear about priests in the New Testament. But here, after this fighting for our brother, here comes our priest. And this priest is coming not to reward him, but to feed him. And there's even a little bit of significance here. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll get into that in a second. But in addition to feeding, he also blesses Abram. And he blesses him with these two... Uh, with the, he blesses Abram and he blesses God by giving us the, these two titles of God. And by seeing these two titles, this showed Abram something of God and his, and his nature of God who he was. He was God the Most High and he was God possessor of heaven and earth. Most High means he's sitting above every kingdom. He's above every throne. And in this day and age, there's a lot of news, and we're watching a lot about kings and actually a queen, right? And this ruler going for this land. Guess who's above all of those? God the Most High. This is the one that Abram meets after he recovers his brother. You'd think he'd go into battle and know that he had God the Most High with him. But Melchizedek didn't come with that welcome till after the battle. 
And this shows us a little bit of a picture. We need to be those, actually, who fight for our brother. And it, we may ask, how do we do that? And we'll see in, in just a point. But sometimes the victory that God has already promised to us as believers isn't visible to us yet. That victory comes after we cooperate with him to go and to care for the brothers. So the other title that came out, not just God of the Most High, but the second title, he's the Possessor of Heaven and Earth. What does that mean? What does that mean if I possess something? Right? I got this 2018 MacBook. I possess it. It's mine. I can type on it what I want. I can put my fingerprint on it. It unlocks everything. This is God, possessor of heaven and earth. Did he not know that four kings were going to come and attack and win the victory over five kings? Of course. Did he not know that 318 men in this army that got mustered very quickly, split in half, would defeat those four kings? Of course. Did he not know that exam wasn't going to go so well for you this week? Of course. I have to share a little personal story. I've, I had two of my boys in the last two weeks hit their head very hard at school. And as a parent, I'm sitting there just grieving. Like, what could I have done? There's nothing I could have done. But in that situation, I was reminded He's the God of Most High. My God is possessor of heaven and earth. I had a whole email written out, right? This is what you should have done to prevent this. And I looked at him like, that's not sensible to send that. That was not a preventable act. It, it happened. But that was the Lord using that situation to remind me. He's got everything in his control. And this is what we want to take away from this story. When we see a brother or a sister who's separated, maybe not doing so well, our response is not, oh, well. Our response is to turn, to meet, right? To fight for this one and to meet Melchizedek. When we meet Melchizedek, there's going to be something that happens. We're blessed with meeting God the Most High we're blessed with recognizing he's sovereign. He possesses heaven and earth. And look at his spontaneous response. Abram turns around and gives a tenth of all he had. And sometimes we take this verse, and we don't talk about money in the church that much. You may be in a place, and they'll say, well, give 10% of your possessions to, to the church or to the Lord. Actually, we're all the Lord's, right? He possesses heaven and earth. Everything we have is the Lord's. And this particular kind of connotation is to not just give 10, it's to give your best tenth. To give in a consideration of my time and my energy and my finances, I'm going to give the best 10% of that to the Lord. And so that's Abram's response when meeting God. And that's our response. When we meet God, we spontaneously say, Lord, I'm your possession. I belong to you. I'm all yours. Here's 10% here's right away. Do whatever, but I'm all yours. Whatever you need, I belong to you. And so out of this response, we might say, okay, that's a wonderful Old Testament story with some connection to us as believers. I can kind of understand that. I can relate to that. But... And this is where the Bible is just a wonderful book. Look what gets written about this little story. I'm going to lead us to Psalm 110. This is a psalm written by David thousands of years later, right? Hundreds, hundreds. Psalm 110.4. Let's read that together. Jehovah has sworn, and he will not change. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. What? In the middle of the Psalms, here comes this king again? This isn't coincidental. This isn't act, not um, just accidental. This is a reminding to us 
that when we meet this Melchizedek, after we have fought for our brothers, a number of things happen. We're fed. I'll go, I'll go back. We're fed with the bread and wine. And we, we see that in the church on, on, on the Lord's Day. We enjoy the communion with the believers. That's the bread and wine. What else is our portion? We recognize he's the sovereign one. Nothing happens on this earth that's not under his, his control. And we also recognize that he possesses everything. This is the picture. Every time we hear Melchizedek, we want to be reminded that these happen. And then not just David, but I'm going to lead us into some verses, and there's so many I actually didn't put them all down. But let's read Hebrews 5, 6. Even as also in another place, he says, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And then again in Hebrews 5 and 6 and 7. This is our brother Paul writing in the New Testament showing us that that story isn't just a historical story. That story is for us today. And here is why it's for us today. I'm just going to jump over to these verses. Let's read these together. Let's read uh, Hebrews 8.1, brothers on 8.1, sisters on 7.25. Now, now in the things which are being said, the chief point is this. We have such a high priest who sat down on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. We have such a high priest. That Melchizedek that was talked about is actually Christ today. And Paul spends four chapters. I invite you to just get into those. As you're reading Hebrews, recognize Paul is full of this imagery. Who is this mysterious one with no genealogy? He actually calls him out. He says, we don't know his, who his father and mother is. Paul's struggling with this, but he recognizes after this whole uh, expounding on this high priest, he says, we have such a high priest. We have someone who's coming to feed us. We have someone that when he's in our presence, we realize God is on the throne. We realize everything is under his control. Even my body is his, right? That's the spontaneous response when we meet Christ. And this is what fighting for the brothers results in when we fight. And again, I, I haven't gotten to this, this last verse. And let's have the sisters read Hebrews 7.25. Hence also he is able to save to the uttermost those who come forward to God through him, since he lives always to intercede for them. So I've used this word to intercede, but that right there is where our cooperation meets the high priest, right? Where it's not just a story of Abram anymore. It's not even just a Paul expounding in Hebrews. This is where that becomes our reality. And I'm just going to use, des describe, I looked up the word intercession. And here's just a de dictionary definition. It's the act of intervening on behalf of another. And this intervening means to come between so as to prevent or alter a result or to change a course of events right? That right there is what happened to us one day. We were on a trajectory. We were going in a certain direction, and there was an intervening. Maybe it's through our parents. Maybe it's through a friend. Maybe it's someone who, who brought you to a meeting. For sure, someone who had been praying for you. Maybe you didn't even know them. That intervention changed the course of events Four kings defeated five kings. 318 cut in half de defeated four kings. That intervention was a result of us fighting for the brothers in a way of prayer. And we want to tie this all back to this wonderful Christ who lives in us. When news comes to us of someone, right, who's been separated, fallen away, is our response, oh, well, too bad, that's really hard? Or is there a bold decision to say, Lord, you don't want to see that one in sin. 
You don't want to see that one in wickedness. Lord, save her. Lord, bring him back. That is our cooperating with this heavenly high priest, this Old Testament Melchizedek in the New Testament today who's our Christ. So I'd just like to encourage us as um, we um, end here, there's more words. And as you read these passages in Hebrews, you'll see he's a priest who abides forever. He lives according to an indestructible life. There's all these descriptors that just point out what a Christ we have. What an interceding one in us. And this all comes from our seeing him and cooperating with him. And we can see this. The Lord has even arranged situations for us to cooperate with him to rescue others out of those situations.